All right. So, as I said, some of them, consider this a review of what we've done this unit. Um, this might help you too if you're still working on the financial planner project. If you need more time on that, by the way, feel free to shoot me an email and just let me know. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, it's due tomorrow technically, but if you need weekend or part of next week, feel free. Because I mean, a lot of people have off next week, so or at least a few days next week. So, um, so this first one, Jim was uh, has a part time job, and basically what we want to do, I give you a list of things. He pay what he pays for tuition, seventy bucks for five bucks for groceries, sixty bucks monthly for uh, rent, or six hundred for rent, uh, and all these things. And what you want to do is we want to create a monthly budget. For Jim, listing his income and expenses, and a definition we haven't seen in a while, uh, his mon monthly cash flow. So remember, monthly cash flow was um, income minus expenses. <laughs> Sorry about that. Income minus expenses. So basically, it's how much money you have after you've paid all your bills um, per month based on what you get. So, you know, if it's negative, you're probably in a bad place because you don't have enough money to cover your bills every month. If it's positive, you're generally in a good place because you do have enough money to cover your bills every month. Right? So for this problem, you just want to list it out. Uh, and there's a few things we have to adjust because what we want to do things monthly. So for instance, um, he's a part-time job, pays 350 every two weeks. So monthly, that's 700. So I'm just going to write it out. So what is this, his job? You get 700, all right? And so maybe I'll write like income, oops, and then expenses. All right, so uh, let's see. So next, every two weeks, and his grandparents give him 300 bucks every month. So that would go under income as well. He didn't earn it, but it's money coming in. So I'll just put 300, and that's every month, so that's grandparents. Uh, he pays 4000 twice a year for tuition. So that's an expense. And it's 4000 twice a year, right? So if you want to get that into monthly, what you can do is you can say, oh, well, he pays 4000 twice a year. You multiply times two. So every year he pays eight grand. And so if I want the monthly cost, I just divide it by 12. So he pays about 666 bucks per month, which is quite a bit. So that's an expense. 666 and we'll say 67 cents round to there. So that's for college. Right. And you, you can, I'm only labeling them because it makes it easier to check your work, but you don't strictly have to. Um, let's see, what else, what else? Another 75 for groceries every week. So 75 for groceries every week. Again, we want monthly. So there's four weeks in a month. So 75 times four is 300 bucks for groceries, which I guess seems a little excessive for a single person, but maybe not. Maybe he likes food, All right? Um, his rent is 600 every month, another expense. And that one's already in the month term, so that's rent, 600. Uh, 100 bucks every week and a sorted thing. So that's 400 per month, again, four weeks in a month. That's just like random, random stuff. Maybe he needs gas. Um, yeah, and that's it. So again, you do the income for his cash flow. So you do, I guess I'll total these up. So totals. So 700, 300, 1,000 bucks. Right. And this one, maybe we'll need a calculator. Maybe not. So four, six is 1,000, 1,300. And then, so it's going to be 19, six, six, 67. So he's not in a good place, right? Because his expenses are more than his income. So his cash flow equals, it's going to be his income, a thousand bucks, minus his expenses, which is, it's just not good. He's not, he's not living life uh, in a, in healthily. Although, so a lot of people in college, this is kind of a reality, right? Because you're not making money in college, except maybe, so like you got, he has a part-time job. Um, so that, that is realistic. And I guess the idea is you take some loans out uh, during college and then it will pay off in the end when you're working a better job. So oh, let me write this down here. So minus uh, nine, six, six, 67. 
right? So, you know, if, if Jim is a college student, this might be in an appropriate budget because even though he's losing money, maybe his parents left him some, maybe he has a bigger savings account that his parents left him somewhere far off, or maybe, um, maybe he's taking out student loans that gives him some extra money to spend. Um, so in that case, he's fine, right? But if he's not in college or he's not in a position where someone's helping him with some regularity, then he's in a pickle, right? <laughs> All right, so questions on that first one. Just a budget. Well, I think budgeting is probably the easier of, of the stuff we've talked about so far. Uh, two. I have too many papers around. Two. Uh, so this is an insurance one. So blah, blah, blah. According to one estimate, the cost of having a kid in the United States. And so this is like uh, medically, not like raising it. So like I, we talked about in the, in the financial planner project, it was $12,000 per year. And I, I believe that's purely just like things the baby needs, the child needs. So like, you, you know, formula or like a crib or something. Um, but this not 10 grand, this is like, would be on top of that theoretically. This is what you're gonna pay for healthcare costs just to have the child. Um, and so we'll take that. It'll, it'll depend where you live, what your insurance is, yada, yada. But this is an average. Um, suppose you have health insurance with an annual premium of 2,100, a deductible of 1,500, and a one-time copay of 250 for services related to the birth of the baby. Uh, uh, after your deductible and copay, your insurance will be 90% of the remaining balance. What is your out-of-pocket cost of having a baby? All right. So again, this is like the cost. And this is like in an ideal situation where nothing goes bad. If anything remotely goes bad and you have to like stay in the hospital, you're more screwed. So <laughs> this is like an ideal situation. Um, but so let's see. So two. So here's what we're going to do. Let's just, it's kind of like a budgeting. We're going to add up all the costs. So right off, right off the bat, right? You know the premium, if you remember what that is, the premium is basically like your subscription cost for your insurance and it's annual. So that's once a year. Um, so we'll just, we'll just add that. We'll say maybe what is it annual, what is the out of pocket cost having a kid for the year? Maybe for the year, right? Cause I guess you don't necessarily, like you, you need your insurance anyway. So like, it's hard to, say how much of the premium is just for your child, but we'll say it all is. Um, so the premium, and again, I'll label things, but you know, it just helps. If you say more organized, your life is uh, better. Uh, 2,100, right? And then we'll do things yearly. You could do it monthly if you want, but it's weird. Um, I just want like all the costs. Um, let's see, a deductible of 1,500. And so, so the cost of the kid, like the cost you have to pay the hospital, like if you had no insurance, you'd have to just give them this 10 grand. So with your insurance, what, what happens is that you, own, you first pay the 1500. So you pay the first $1,500 of that. And so that's, we have to deductible. So we have to pay all of that because um, it is, the cost is more than our deductible. So we have to pay the entire deductible. Okay. Uh, and then we also have this copay of 250. Again, I don't quite understand copay, but whatever. Um, now, this one, like I talked about uh, last class, is a little different. So after you, after you pay the deductible, the insurance company will pay 90% of the remaining balance. So you do 9,800. There we go. I feel like this is very tiny today. I don't know why. The camera's still off, but there we go. Maybe that gives me some room. <laughs> it feels so cramped doing this sometimes. 9,800, all right. Oh, I can do it all. Uh, perfect. All right, so that's the total cost. But And we paid 1,500 for our deductible. All right, so there's 8,300 left. Um, I honestly don't know if the copay counts towards that. It will say it does. So I'll take off the copay. If you didn't take off the copay, I probably wouldn't take off points because I it probably Probably depends. Um, so after we pay the copay, after we pay our deductible, there's that much left. And the insurance company says that they'll cover 90% of it. So we only have to cover not 10% of it, right? So 100 minus 90 is 10. So the remaining 10% is all on us. So I'm gonna take 10% of this. So I'm gonna do times, and 10% is just 0.1, right? Or 0 0.10, if that makes you feel better. So 805, I have to pay another 80, 100, 805 bucks. So remaining 10% is 805 bucks. 
Mm. And so that's what, that's what I pay. And so if I add all these up, that would be my out-of-pocket costs for this medical um, situation. Again, maybe you don't include the premium in here because that's just something you have to pay regardless of whether or not you have the kid. But it, I'll include it here just to get a like a holistic idea of everything that we're that's going into it. So I add up all the costs and then 805 at the end. And so about 4,600 bucks is what you're gonna pay. So it's gonna be 4655, right? right. So that's the, that's the cost. And so, you know, it seems like a lot, but without the insurance, you would have had to just pay this 10 grand entirely out of pocket, which is also not ideal. So, uh, so any questions with two? Again, just definitions mainly, premium, deductible, copay, make sure you understand how those things kind of interact. Uh, remember, premiums, the subscription cost, the deductible is how much you have to pay before the insurance will cover anything. And then the copay is like a service fee every time you use the service, right? And so this 250 would probably be distributed among different like service providers. Like maybe one day you have to go to, you know, uh, one doctor, the other day you have to go to another doctor. Maybe the one costs 10, the other costs 20 copay. Yeah. All right, so that's two. Uh, three, we're just making progress. Like, again, this is hopefully just like a review. I, I, I feel like sometimes reviews are good to help consolidate all the things we've learned and help put them in perspective. Um, so as I said, three and four are all about compounding interest. And on the proper tests I'll put up that, you know, you don't have to do an over break. You, you could, I'll have, I'll have it do sometime the week we come back. So don't, if you don't want to, if you want to take a whole week, week off for break, feel free and just do it like the day before it's due or something. Um, but I, know I had a student once complain to me about when I signed homework over break, and I, I mean, well, yeah, whatever. Um, so an APR to 3.2% compounded monthly. We've done a bunch of these compound interest formula ones. So hopefully when you see all this information, it doesn't, it's not confusing as so much. You just, you're organizing it in your head. Like this is my APR. So my APR is 0 0.032. My month, it's monthly. So N is 12. Um, and the first question says, if you open a bank account with principal one, two, three, four, how much money will you have in one year? So this is a simple, just like plugging things into the interest formula. And um, if you forgot it, well, I guess I'll rewrite it. Um, so it's P, oops, sorry, it's A equals P naught one plus APR over N to the N Y, All right? So here P naught my principal, what I'm starting with. APR is my, my interest rate as a decimal. N is the number of times per year it compounds, and Y is the number of years you're allowing it to compound. Oh, and, and A will be the amount in the account after Y years. All right, so I just plug everything in. So I, I wanna find A, I wanna find how much is in the account after one year. My principal is one, two, three, four. And I just, you know, my, my APR, as I said, was 0 0.032. N was, I don't know what I say, 12. And then 12 and one year, so times one. Right? And so now you compute it and, um, you know, feel free to use whatever calculator you prefer. Um, let's see, okay, I can get everything on there. Cool. So 0 0.032 divided by 12. And, you know, uh, you don't have to memorize any of these formulas, by the way, like it, what, uh, you, it's an open, like note take home test. So, uh, don't feel like you need to memorize anything. I, I don't like memorize things. So feel free to look things up for the take home. Um, so anyway, this was uh, this thing here, and then I add one. And so that's the thing in the parentheses. 12 times one is just 12. So it's to the 12th power and you get something. And then times one, two, three, four. Ah, one, two, three, four. So after that year, I have $1,274.07. All right, so okay, you can see it. Um, and yeah. So that's it. That's, that's the first part of this question. That's A. All right, sorry about this. Let me move this over. That's better. All right, so now B is the more interesting part. As I said, for the take home tests I, that I'll assign soon, I want it to be disjoint from the, the project that I assigned. So you're not kind of repeating things too much. Um, so the APY, let's recall what the APY was, right? So the APY. Like there is a formula that we can use, but there's also an intuitive way to remember it. 
So it's called the annual percent yield. So it's basically the relative change in an account over one year. So if you remember relative change, it was new minus old over new. And it, it applies to anything. Uh, you can apply it to like the growth of like, I don't know how many TVs you have in your house be, from now and next year, if that's increasing, I don't know, mine is, um, uh, or anything. It, it's just, you're talking about change as a percent of what it started as. And so here it's just talking about, you take the new amount in the account, subtract the old and divide it by the old. So uh, as I said, balance after one year, minus principal. So principal is just what you start with, right? All over principal. And this will be as a decimal, whatever this is. Uh, and so you can leave it as a decimal. Usually APR is written as a percent because it, it's the percent yield, but either way. Um, and so here, my balance after one year is what we computed in part A. So it's it kind of does it for you if you if you think about it. Like it's just it's making your life simpler. The principal was one two three four, so minus one two three four, and then all over one two three four. And now you plug plug that in your calculator. Yeah. So let's see. Did I did you leave my answer? I didn't. So that's what I had. Oh, you can't see that. So this is what I had for the amount after one year. And then I subtract the initial, what I started with. Let me get that. And I divide it by what I started with. Right. So as a decimal, it's 0 0.032, I don't know, five. You know, you do as many as you like. Um, and then, so to get it as a percent, I just multiply it times 100. So as a percent, it's 3.25%. I'm, I'm rounding there a little bit. Feel free to round to whatever you like. All right. All right, so that's my APY. Um, and what should happen, remember when we talked about APY is what the interesting phenomena that occurs you know, there, is that if you look at the APR of the account here, it's 3.2%, but the APY is slightly more. It's 3.25. So what's happening is that since it's compounded monthly, it's compounded more than once a year, you're getting slightly more interest than you would if it was compounded once a year. So if, if, this, if this bank compounded their interest once a year, your APR and your APY would be the same. But since they're compounding it monthly, you get a slightly higher number. If they were doing it weekly or daily, you'd get even bigger numbers. They're not gonna be much bigger. They're not gonna get too much bigger than 3.2, but they're gonna be just ever so much more, all right? So the idea there is that um, you, you, get a, you get a bit more money. Your yield over the year is slightly more, the more time you compound, just a little. You get, it's like diminishing returns. Hey, so it's really neat. Um, and as I said, this is just relative change, if you remember from way back at the beginning of the semester. Right? So we're kind of re we reuse a lot of topics. All right, questions with that number three? That's it. Awesome. Four, let me put a four here. So for four, again, this one is a little different. It's still compound interest, but it's just like a twist. Um, you invest 100 bucks in an account compounded quarterly. Again, you want to try to pick out these kind of words and then identify what they correspond to in the equation. Um, what APR would you need to double your money in one year? So this is a funky one, right? Because usually when we're given compound interest formula, uh, compound interest problems, we're asked things like, you know, how much will you have in four years or things like that. Um, but here we want to find the APR. And so whenever this sort of occurs, you just you just do, you just plug everything in that you know and solve for what you don't know. And that just generally is, is a good, is a good habit that always will work for you. So uh, let's, let's give it a go. All right. So I know that I have a principal of hundred dollars. It's compounded quarterly. So P naught is hundred N is four APR is question mark. And I want to double my money. So let's see what we have. So I'll just rewrite the equation. It's compound interest. So it's just not to be A, the amount in the account after whatever years, equals P naught, one plus uh, APR is a question mark. So I'll leave it as APR over four. And then 
in one year. So it's 4n times 1y. Right? Sorry, it's a little scribbly. All right. Uh, in my p naught, it was 100. I forgot to plug that in. 1 plus API over 4. And then to the 4, because 4 times 1 is, is 4. Um, and then on this side, for the a, we want to double our money. So two, 2 times 100 is just 200. So it's just 200 on the left. And so this is our equation. And basically, we just want to solve it now. So I want to solve for APR. And it is a little, a little bit of algebra. But uh, the first thing I can do is divide both sides by 100. So I get 200 over 100 equals 1 plus APR over 4 to the 4. Right? And now this is where if you, some of us might get a little stumped because it's not something that we've done a lot of. Uh, but if I have, this is equal to 2, right? right? So 2 equals this thing. And I want to solve for the, the APR. I want to solve for the, the variable inside the, the power 4. So the opposite of exponentiation is, is taking a root. So if this was a 2, we would take a square root. But since it's a 4, we're going to take a fourth root, or whatever. I don't know actually what it's called. Uh, it's, it's a fourth root, I guess. So uh, the way that looks is um, some, sometimes you'll see it like, like this. So you look at fourth root of 2 equals fourth root of 1 plus APR over 4, the 4. And then just like the square root and the square, the fourth root and the four cancel. And so this is just one plus APR over four. And this is a number. Like if you go to your calculator, uh, none of them, I don't know, this one does. I don't know that my, my fancy one does. But on this calculator here, so it's kind of hard to see, but you see that it's like, there you go, x in the root and then square root. So what I can do, I don't actually know how it's going to work, but it, you should be able to do it on here. I'm not super sure. Hey, maybe that's it. I don't know. Let's see. And then two. Hey, that might be it. All right. So I, it, it will depend on your calculator, but some of them do have a quarter root. And so if this did it right, if I raise that to the four, I get two. All right. So it did work. Um, Another way you can do it without using fancy buttons is this is equal to 2 to the 1 over 4. Right? So fractional ex ex exponents correspond to roots, um, just like, just like um, x to the 1 half equals the square root of x. Same kind of thing. Right? Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, I just want to solve for my APR now. So I subtract one from both sides. So I get two to the one quarter minus one equals APR over four. And now again, I want to solve for my APR. So I just multiply both sides by four. So four times whatever this is, two to the quarter minus one equals APR. And it looks really ugly, but like I said, you can solve it in your calculator. So on this one, which is a little more standard, I think, um, I'll do two, and then, as I said, I'll just do, oops, that's not what I want. I want two, and then the exponent, there we go. The exponent is going to be one-fourth, so one divided by four, and that's going to be that. Minus one is whatever that is, and times four. So um, as a percent, My APR would have to be seven, just about 76%, 75.7%. It's crazy. So that's an unrealistic APR. Um, you, to double your 100 bucks in one year, that's what your, your, adjustment would have to, your APR would have to be. It's never going to happen. Um, so this one's a little more algebraically intensive, as I said, than, than some of the other ones. I'm, I'm not sure if this one will end up on the test, but I, I kind of like this problem because it, it uses some, some tools, algebraic tools that we don't use very often in this class. All right, questions with, uh, what are we on, four? Four, no? Four. All right, I need a new pad. All right, five. All right, so five and six, as I said, do overlap with the, the project a little bit. So I'm not sure I'll, I'll put those on there. 
um, at least in their current form, I got to figure it out. But um, the first one here, five, you want to purchase a new car in three years and expect to pay $30,000 for the new car. Your bank offers a plan with a guaranteed APR of 5.5% if you make monthly deposits. How much should each deposit be to end up with $30,000 in three years? So you want to pay off the car in three years. You don't want to linger. It's not like a house or anything. So you have, you have to kind of be a little more strategic. So this, um, what do I want to say? It's, it's going to be a loan, right? Uh, guarantee APR if you make regular monthly deposit. Is it going to be a loan? No, I guess this is a saving. It could be both. Savings. I'll read a savings plan because this one's going to be a loan. Uh, you have a credit card. So I anticipate this one to be a loan. This one be a savings plan. But I think you could read. I, I'm just reading it. You could read this as a loan problem too, I think. Like it, you could, the bank, I think it, I should have phrased it better, but my, inter my, my intention was that the bank is offering you a, um, like, a, like a special savings plan and they give you this really high deposit if you continually put in a lot of money. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's more of a savings plan in this problem. At least that's what I intended. I think you could, if you read this uh, independently though, you might be able to, you might say like, oh, they're offering you like financing. It's a more, it's like a loan. So in that case, you'd use the loan one. It, it doesn't really matter. Okay. I just want to, I just want to play around with these equations. Um, so this is, I wrote this little list. And so this is just all the formulas that we've used. This is compound interest. We just use that one, right? Simple interest. We haven't used yet, but we use that one at the end. It's number seven. Um, APR or APY. This is the one we use for APY, right? Balance after one year minus principal over principal. And I like this one more. If you look in the textbook or in my notes um, from the APY, when we did APY in class, you'll see this one here. And it's very concise and it will give you APY, but it's not very intuitive. So I, I like to use just a straightforward formula. Um, and anyway, for the savings plan, it's going to be this one here. And the savings plan and the loan formula, very similar. Uh, as I said, don't, don't memorize any of these. There's no reason to do that. Just kind of have them written down and kind of organized in your head. Um, so savings plan, that's what we need here. Let's see. So let me write it all out. So this is five. And let me just write the savings plan formula. So uh, A equals PMT and then one plus APR over M to the NY minus one all over APR over N. So that's the savings plan formula. All right. And let's try to identify what the variables are in this problem. So the loan is for 30,000, or I want to save up 30,000. Sorry, not a loan. I want to save up 30,000 in three years. So my A is going to be 30,000. Because that's how much I want in the account. And then Y will be three years, All right? The payment, the, that, that the payment is the question. How much should each monthly deposit be? So PMT equals question mark. So that's what we want. We want to figure out the payment each monthly payment. Um, and then the APR is 5.5% and everything is monthly. So N is 12, right? So let's try to plug all that in. So PMT is question mark, so, but I'll leave it as PMT. That's one plus the APR was 5.5%. So don't forget, it's always as a decimal, 0 0.055. And everything in this problem is monthly. So N would be 12. Uh, you want to pay it off in three years, so you're going to be pretty, uh, pretty, pretty quick with it. So it's going to be 12 times three, minus one, and then all over APR again is 0 0.055 over 12. Right. So let's see. And so we we did back when we were talking about the savings plan formula. I we did a couple of these examples in class, and what we did is if I want to solve for the payment, what I'll do is I'll compute this big ugly thing here get it as a decimal and then just divide 30,000 by it, whatever that decimal is and solve for PMT, all right? So let's see. So let me start, as, as I said, computing this, this thing here, right? Next, next to the PMT variable. So 0 0.055 divided by 12, all right? So that's this thing, plus one. That's the thing in parentheses now. 12 times three is 36. So it's all to the 36 power. And then minus one, right? 
And then, it, this, so that's the whole top. This is the numerator point. And you can round this if you like. You could write it in. So it's 0. 0.1789, whatever. Um, and then I divide it by this thing here. So divided by 0. 0.055 divided by 12. And if you're doing this uh, on your calculator, make sure you put parentheses around this, this, this division here. Because if you don't put parentheses, it might not interpret it correctly. Um, it might still. I don't know. It depends on the calculator. Um, but yeah, so 0. 0.055 divided by 12. And then bam. And so it's okay. So this is, so, I've, so if I write it in, so I have 30,000 and then equals PMT. And then this whole thing here, that whole, that whole jam, this whole thing is equal to 39.04. And you can round, the more you round, the more you'll get off, but it's okay. 39.04, all right. And so now if we wanna solve for PMT, again, PMT is just a variable. I just divide both sides by 39.04 to get PMT by itself. So $30,000 divided by 39.4 or 04 equals PMT. And so now we just divide. So 30,000 divided by 30,000 divided by 39.04. So it's it's a lot. It's $768 and 40 cents give or take. So Seven six eight point three eight. That is my monthly payment. So, I mean, that so in this situation, that could be why the bank would be willing to give you such a high interest rate because you're you're depositing such a large amount of money in your account so fast. Um, and so maybe they 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 find that interesting somehow. Like they want the money, so they're gonna give you more interest on it. I don't know if that's realistic. But anyway, any questions with that? So that's um, five, right? So again, we just plugged everything into the savings plan formula and then solved for the unknown variable. And with these problems, you always it's basically always the same thing. If you're using the savings plan or loan formula, it will give you all the variables but one and you're just essentially solving for the unknown. Um, so like in the next question, six, as I said, I identified six as a loan question because it asks you have $10,000 forgot my dollar sign, on a credit card with an APR of 18%, and you want to pay off the balance in two years. So just like the same thing. Um, and now there's some questions. <laughs> what would monthly payments be? So that's PMT, question mark. And then these two kind of use this and analyze them a little bit. So let's start with A. So again, just identify all the variables, right? You have $10,000 on the card. Oh, and I should write my, my loan formula. So my loan formula, I'll just rewrite it. Um, I'll write it like this. So PMT, let me make that straight, equals P naught APR over N over one minus one plus APR. They get like progressively uglier for some reason, minus NY, right? And uh, if you look in the book, there's, there's a couple versions. If you look in the book, you might see this one somewhere in there, um, but they're, they're just the same equation, but they've been rearranged a little bit. So if, if, you're, if you're looking at the textbook and you see this one, don't, don't feel like you're, you're, you have the wrong equation. They're the same equation, but they've just been swapped. Like the place of the P naught and the PMT is swapped, which is why the bottom and the tops are swapped. <laughs> All right, it's the same equation. This one is a more convenient format for us though, because for part A, it asks us to find the monthly payment. So solve for PMT, all right? And if you forgot this equation, this the PMT is the payment, monthly payment. Or, well, depending if N is 12. P naught is the amount of the loan. APR is the APR of the loan, the interest rate. Um, and Y is the length of the loan. So like on, your, on your, your financial project, when you found the mortgage on the house, it was a 30 year mortgage. So in that problem, your Y was 30, your APR was whatever the, the mortgage rate was, and it was monthly, so your N was 12. And then your P naught was how much more they had to pay on the house. So I think the down payment was like 30 grand, the house was 150, so P naught should have been like 120, 120,000, something like that. But anyway, so here it's a little different, as I said, because we're a credit card and not a house, but it's the same formula. So my PMT is going to be P naught is 10,000, um, it feels weird putting a dollar sign, but it's okay. APR is 18%. It's outrageous, 0.18. Everything's monthly here. 
right? I'm assuming. Um, and then for the bottom, we do the same kind of thing. So it's one minus one plus 0 0.08 over 12 to the minus 12. And then uh, the question says, you want to pay it off in two years. So at y is two. There we go. And there's no solving for this one, unlike the previous question. This question, all we have to do is compute this somehow. So maybe we'll do it on this one now. All right, we see, there we go. All right, so I'll start with the bottom. So I have 0 0.08. Hey, Matt. Yeah. You have 0 0.08 and 1.8 oh, on. Thank you, it's 1.8, it's 18%. You're welcome. <laughs> 0 0.18, and then divide by 12. All right, and so that's this thing, this little block, uh, plus one. So that's this thing in parentheses. And then 12 times two is 24. So it's all to the minus 24. Okay. I don't know if I need parentheses, but I always like parentheses. There you go. All right, so this number is gonna be everything in the parentheses and the exponentiation. And now I need to do one minus that. So again, feel free to write any of this down independently. So you could do like one minus 0.6995 maybe. And then, you know, plug that in your calculator if you don't want to use any fancy buttons. But I'll just do one minus and then second answer. Right? And so that 0 0.300 is going to be that. Right? So, um, and I guess I'll write that maybe 0 0.3005. All right, and so that's my bottom. So my whole denominator is 0 0.3005, give or take. And now I need to compute the top. So I'll do 10,000 times 0.18 divided by 12 again. Oops. There we go. So it's, the top is 150. And uh, so 150 over 0 0.3005. And so now I just divide that by 0 0.3005. So we did it a little differently this time. <laughs> oh, I didn't do it. Um, 150 divided by it, sorry, 0 0.3005. There we go. So it's about 499 and 17 maybe. So um, any questions with that? So we're just, we plugged everything into the, the loan payment formula uh, and we just solved Again, use the calculator as much as you like. Do it in pieces. If you're using your phone calculator, definitely do it kind of like this, where you do it step by step and write down the answer. Because if my, the iPhone calculator is not, it doesn't work very well. Um, I always screw it up. So anyway, so that is A. B says, how much will you pay in total? Oh, you can't see it. How much will you pay in total? So <clears throat> for this one, you just have to realize how many times you're paying the 499 bucks, and then for how long? So it's a two year loan because you wanna pay it off in two years and you're doing it monthly, monthly payments. So monthly payments for two years. So it's gonna be 24 total payments of the $499. So it's gonna be 12 times two, so monthly. And then two years, you can't see that there, there you go, two years. And the payments are four ninety nine, just like we found out in the, the previous problem. So it's whatever that is. So twelve times two times four nine nine point one seven. So it's, it's a decent amount of money. It's eleven thousand nine hundred and eighty bucks and eight cents. And so that's how much you're paying total for the convenience of using ten thousand dollars from this credit card. Right. So part B is pretty quick. <laughs> And then C, what percentage of the total payment you found in part B is for interest? Oh, it, I haven't posted online yet. I, was gonna, I, didn't, I didn't wanna overwhelm people by posting a, uh, a practice test that I didn't talk about when there was another assignment due. So <laughs> I haven't posted it. I'll post it probably tonight or tomorrow. Um, and then the proper test will be due when we come back at some point, so. Okay, cause I was sitting here, I was like, I was looking for it and I was like, <laughs> I don't see it. Yeah, I don't. You know, I sometimes I feel bad if I post things and I already have. Like, I don't want to overwhelm students. I I feel like it's too easy to do that. Even though it's like not. Yeah, it, it's it's okay. Um. So uh, 
yeah, so what percentage of the total payment you found in part B is for interest? So the interest, the whole loan itself, the whole loan itself is only for 10 grand, right? And so overall we found we we're paying almost 12,000. So the interest will be the difference. So for C, the interest will be equal to what we found in part B, 11,980 bucks and eight cents and then minus the, the principal. So you, you actually use the 10,000, but you're paying 12,000 for the convenience. So your interest overall is gonna be $1,980.08. So are we having a test the Tuesday we come back? Or are you gonna like delay it a little bit and do more review after we come back for a week? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna post the test sometime during, probably before the end of this week. And then you'll have, you can do it whenever you want. You can do it. Um, it won't be due when we come back. It'll be due like probably that Thursday or something. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, some people don't want to do any work over Thanksgiving break, which I understand. So uh, I'll give you like a little wiggle room when we come back to do it, if you don't have time to do it. Um, anyway, so the interest, so that's my interest. And then it says, what percentage of the total payment is for interest? So the total payment was this. So to find the percentage that is interest, I take the part over the whole. So um, as a percent, it's just gonna be the interest, 198008 over what I have to hold, the whole payment. So 198008, right? So let's see what that is. So 1980.08, looks good, divided by, uh, I already have it there, so let's do second. Right. So it's 0.165, and then as a percent, is it makes more sense, so times 100. So 16.5%. So 16.5% of every payment, essentially, that you make is interest. So uh, that you can break it down like that. Yeah, something. All right, questions for six? All right, and we're the last one. So the last one is kind of like what we were talking about uh, Tuesday. Uh, seven. So it's kind of a two-parter. I just kind of wrote it as a long block. Um, so you bought 400 shares of Pepsi stock in 1985 for an average of $3.16. I Googled it, apparently that's what it was. I don't know how that works. I don't think that incorporates inflation. I don't know if that matters for stocks. It probably does. Um, $3.16 per share. Today in 2020, you sell it for $141.34, which is what the Pepsi, Pepsi stock is right now. Um, how much money did you make in the 35 years you own the stocks? Right. So the first part, that's basically the first part. Right there is a break. So we'll do that first, then we'll come back. Um, so basically all we do here is, is we've, we compute how much we bought them for in 1985 and we compute how much we sold them for today, and then just subtract, right? So there's no fancy formula there. Um, it's literally just multiply and subtract. So, so in 1985, we paid, so we have 400 shares, so it's gonna be 400, and then the cost per share was 316. So 400 times 316, oops. So we, oh, that works out oddly well. So we paid, we paid $1,264 in 1985. And again, there is inflation. I don't know, I don't think it really matters though, because if you own the stock, you're, you're owning that piece of the company. You're not, there's not a monetary value necessarily attached to it. So I don't think the inflation really counts. Um, anyway, and then in 2020, we sold for, so again, this, there's still 400 shares. I didn't buy or sell any of my shares, but in 2020, they were worth $100, $141.34. So now we do the same thing. So 400 times 141.34. So now, that's how much they're worth now. So you, you sold them for $56,536. All right, and so if I subtract, what I sold it for, uh, and I take, or I should take, if I take away what I bought them for from what I sold it for, so 56,536 minus 1264, my buying price, 
I made I made five fifty five thousand two hundred seventy two dollars. So I made so it's gonna be fifty six five three six minus one two six four, and that's fifty five thousand uh, two hundred seventy two dollars. All right. And so that's how much I made with this investment over is what was it thirty five years. Right. So it, it took a while, but that's how much money you made. All right. So any questions for that first section? So stocks, we don't really get too much into. So if you look at some books, like the old book we used to use, or I think some problem solving sections at JCC still use it, um, there's like a little stock ticker that it shows you how to read and it's a little unnecessarily complicated. So we're just kind of doing a simplified stock. Uh, and then the second part, in 1985, you also bought, you were champing it in 1985, you bought a certain high-risk bond with simple interest rate of 8%. So I Googled it and apparently they, they do exist, do exist high-risk bonds with high interest rates. I don't know what they are exactly, but apparently they are a thing. Um, of 8% and the bond was worth 15,000 and it matured in 35 years, right? So remember that some of these definitions with, with bond um, you could have also, instead of saying simple interest rate, you could have also called this the coupon rate. Um, and then what happens with bonds is you, you pay that 15,000 and you, if you take, if you want your money back before the 35 years, when it matures, you, you, you have to pay like a fine depending on the bond, depending on where you buy it. Um, there's a fine or sometimes I don't not even be able to take it out at all. Uh, so, so it's kind of like, a, it can be a long-term investment. Like this one here, we took it out for 35 years and it was worth 15,000. So we initially paid that 15,000, uh, but over 35 years, they promised to give us 8% every year. Right. And it's simple interest. Bonds are simple interest. So what we'll do, so for, this is for the stocks. And so for the bonds, what we'll do is simple interest, remember, so it's 8%. And so, so the interest per year is going to be how much the bond is worth. So 15,000 and then it's 8%. So times 8%, right? And so there we go. So it'll be 15,000 times 0 0.08. And so every year for 35 years, they'll pay us 1200 bucks. All right, questions there? All right, so every year we get that much money. And so over 35 years, uh, we make, so you do the interest per year times 35. So 42,000. So it's gonna be 1200 times 35. And it was what, 42,000, right? So that's the interest. All right, so now the way bonds work too, is that you, you don't just get your interest back, but you get the initial money back that you gave them. Like the bond itself is worth that much money. So you get the 15,000, and the 42. So, so overall, you get um, the 42, the 15,000 plus 42,000. Right? So, what is that, 57,000? So, that's what you get with the simple, there's simple interest. It's very dark in my room. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, just to compare and contrast, right? The stock, we bought them for a certain price. They went up considerably, and then we sold them for another price. And I subtracted off what I bought them for initially because that's money I had to pay for it. Here for the bond, I'm giving them 15,000. Uh, and every year they give me interest on that for 35 years. And it's kind of like you're giving them this money for this amount of time. So they give you the interest kind of for having your money for that many years. Um, and then at the end, they give you back your principal along with the interest. 
all right? And the interest is, so like in this kind of situation, this 1200 bucks would like be mailed to you in a check or it would be like directly deposited into like a check, another checking account or something. Um, but it would not, like the bond is always 15,000. It's not gonna change how much it's worth, right? So that's why it's simple interest, right? So remember bonds, simple interest, stock, it's kind of straight computation. And then things like CDs and savings accounts and checking accounts, they're all compound interest. All right, oh, and so the last part of this question, which was a better investment? I don't really know. Um, <laughs> like this one, the bond at the end, you technically have more money, but you also had to put up $15,000 in 1985. I don't know how much that, much that is in 2020 money, but um, it's probably, it's a, it was decently expensive in 85, so it's even more now. Um, but, you know, so this one you have, you would put up this money and kind of, it was tied up for 35 years. Whereas with the stocks, initially I only put up $1,200. And in the end, they're worth 50, 55. Like, so I, I would say the stock was a better option be, because, you know, if I bought $15,000 in stock money or in, in Pepsi, I would be, I'd be so much more wealthy, right? So if I bought $15,000 in these stocks in 1984, let's see how much that is. So $15,000, 316 of stock. So I could buy 4746 4, shares of Pepsi. So 4746. I'll just round down, right? Um, and then if I sold them for 141 bucks in 2020, I'd have 600 670,799 dollars. So I'd have over half a million dollars if I took this 15,000 in 1985 and just bought Pepsi stock and waited 35 years, I'd be almost a millionaire. So like the stock is definitely the better investment um, just because your seed money, the money, your principal money was smaller and you end up with so much more. Um, and that's something you could do too. You could look at the, the percent yield, right? So I'm just kind of getting on a tangent, but the percent yield you can think of like you, the money you started with and the money you ended with. So like for this one, right? So this, again, this is not, not related to the question really, strictly speaking, but it's justifying that last answer. So you have 57,000. This is the new minus the old, what I started with, all over the old, right? So if I look at that as a percent, so 57,000 divided by or minus 15,000. That's good divided by 15,000 times 100. So it's 280% growth of my money initially. But, and that seems like a lot and it's, it's decent. It's a good amount of, of growth. But if I look at this one up here, right, as a, as a relative change from what I started with, it's, uh, I'll use this one here. It's gonna be 55,272 minus what I started with one, two, six, four, and then divided by what I started with, divided by one, two, six, four, and then times a hundred. So this one as a percent yield of what I started with, this is a 4,272% growth in my money. So 4,272%, right? So like if you, you, you can either grow your money by 4,000%, or you can grow it by 300%. So obviously the answer is clearly the stock is a better option, even though you kind of seem to get more money for the bond, but this is kind of a subtle point. Any questions about any of this? So again, uh, timeline, the tomorrow's Friday. So I'm sorry, again, I'm sorry it's really dark in here. Tomorrow's Friday. Um, so the financial planner thing is due. Um, but as, as I said, feel free to take more time if you need to. If you can't finish it over the weekend, finish it this week or whatever. Um, and then sometime between now and I don't know, next week, I'll post this and then I'll post the actual, ta actual take home exam. And that will be due when we get back at some point. But don't worry about this yet. I just wanted to cover it in person, well, in person, um, so that you, you could work on it over break or at the beginning of the first week we come back, all right? And, but when we come back, we're gonna be starting new material on that last unit. And then, um, the last day of class, that last Tuesday in December, December 15th, I think I said, we'll do the last test review. And then the test 
will be another take home that I'll give out during like the final exam week. All right, any questions? Awesome. So uh, everyone have a nice Thanksgiving. I hope, I hope we're all uh, safe. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, I hope everyone has a nice Thanksgiving with turkey and everything. So uh, feel free to send me an email if you have any questions over break. Uh, I'll be around. So.